The construction of a shortcut from the Pacific to the Atlantic Oceans was a pipe dream for much of the 19th century, for both the British and Americans. If a canal existed, then trade would be substantially easier, and the United States would be the prime beneficiary. Thus, the US took a keen political, economic, and military interest in the Isthmus of Panama, with construction of the canal finally taking place before the First World War. To protect its vital national interests, the United States maintained a large military presence there throughout the 20th century. When, in the 1980s, with political arguments about the future control over the canal at their zenith, and a new political leader in Panama, in the form of Manuel Noriega, the scene was set for a confrontation between Panama and the United States. This culminated in an invasion of Panama by the United States at the end of 1989, an invasion which deposed Noriega and ensured US control over the canal until 1999, when it was handed over to the people of Panama. Hello, and welcome to another Tank Encyclopedia voiced article. I'm your host Mark, and today I will be covering the build-up to the invasion of the Panama Canal, providing the context, history, and build-up to the conflict. If you like our videos and want to support us, please consider donating on Patreon or PayPal. All of the funds will be used to improve future Tank Encyclopedia content. Any help would be greatly appreciated. The Canal The construction of the Panama Canal was a political minefield, too dangerous to cross for decades, but it was the dream of both the nascent United States and also the British financial trading interests in the 19th century. In 1850, Great Britain and the United States agreed in principle to a canal, albeit through the Isthmus in Nicaragua, in what was known as the clayton bulwer Treaty. The project never got further than the treaty, but it did at least allay a rivalry between the two countries over who would build a canal and control trade between the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. In 1880, the French, led by Ferdinand de Lesseps, the man behind the construction of the Suez Canal, began excavation through what is now Panama. After nine years of failure, the program went bankrupt, and a decade later, in 1901, a new treaty was made. This hay pouncefote Treaty replaced the earlier clayton bulwer Treaty, and in 1902, the US Senate agreed to a plan for the canal. The site of the proposed canal was, however, the problem, with it being on Colombian territory and the financial offer made by the US to Colombia was rejected. Having not got their own way in negotiations with Colombia, President Theodore Roosevelt simply sent US warships, including the USS Dixie and the USS Nashville, with a combined naval and United States Marine Corps landing party to Panama City to support Panamanian independence. The timing was pure opportunism, and with Colombian troops unable to cross the Darien Strait, Panamanian independence was established on the 3rd of November, 1903. With a new, and some might say puppet government in the brand new country, it very kindly agreed to the Neiba-Nauvaria Treaty, signed just 15 days after independence. The terms of this treaty were incredibly one-sided, with the US getting everything it could possibly want to allow it to build a canal and have complete monopoly over not only the canals, lakes and islands en route, but also to a strip of land 10 miles or 16 kilometers wide in which the canal would be constructed. All the Panamanians got for this ransom payment was independence, albeit on completely US terms, a single payment of 10 million US dollars, just under 300 million dollars in 2020 values, and an annual payment starting in year 10 of 250,000 dollars, or 7.4 million dollars in 2020 values. Just 80.4 kilometers long, the canal cost a phenomenal 375 million US dollars, in 2020 money, about 11.1 billion dollars, with an additional 40 million dollars, or 1.1 billion in 2020 values, to buy out the remaining French interests. With around 5,600 deaths from disease and conditions along with construction costs, the US had made an incredible investment in the canal, on the basis of the ne banau varia Treaty, granting it control in perpetuity over the canal zone. Construction was finished in 1913, and the canal officially opened on the 15th of August 1914. 
but the treaty forced on the new Panamanian nation proved a continual irritant, poisoning relations between the two countries. The 16.1 kilometer strip of what was effectively US sovereign territory, governed much as a colony would be, with a presidentially appointed governor, effectively bisected Panama. Civil strife in 1964 led to a March 1973 UN resolution on creating a new canal treaty between the United States and Panama, but the USA was unwilling to cede any control. With international pressure to do so, the United States finally conceded to Panama, with the signing of a new treaty in September 1977 between the nations led by US President Jimmy Carter and Panamanian President Omar Torrijos. Under the terms of the treaty, the United States received, for the duration of the treaty, the rights to transit the canal and also to defend it. More importantly, this treaty laid out a timeline for the handover of the canal to full Panamanian control, with a Panamanian national to be appointed as the deputy administrator until the 31st of December 1999, when both administrator and deputy administrator roles were to be fully ceded to Panama. The Rise of Noriega and the Collapse in Relations In 1983, Colonel Manuel Antonio Noriega was made Commander-in-Chief of the military by Colonel Rubin Parides while he ran for the presidency. Thus Noriega replaced Parides and then persuaded him to withdraw from the race for the presidency, leading to the election of Eric de Valier as president. As a result, Noriega, as head of the Panamanian military, was the de facto leader of the country. During his rise to power, Noriega created a close working partnership with the American Central Intelligence Agency. He had also cooperated with the US Drug Enforcement Agency on providing information on the shipment of cocaine from states like Colombia to the United States and supported the CIA's aid to the Contras. Noriega, however, was playing both sides and was himself involved in the smuggling of cocaine. In February 1988, he was charged in US courts, indicted on drug-related charges. The actual president of Panama, de Valier, attempted to fire Noriega, but failed. In violation of Article 5 of the 1977 treaty, which prohibited any intervention in the internal affairs of the Panamanian Republic, the US then encouraged the Panamanian military to overthrow Noriega, culminating in the failed coup attempt of the 16th of March 1988. As the security in the canal zone deteriorated, it was clear that the existing US forces present were inadequate. President Reagan therefore sent an additional 1,300 troops from both the Army and the Marines to bolster the 193rd Infantry Brigade in a defense plan that was known as Elaborate Maze. The US forces deployed included the 16th Military Police Brigade, the 59th Military Police Battalion, the 118th Military Police Battalion, a rifle company from the 6th Marine Expeditionary Force, an aviation task force consisting of the 23rd Aviation and an attack helicopter company, and the 7th Division Light, including the 3rd Battalion. Presidential elections in Panama followed in May 1989, and the winner was Guillermo Endara, representing the Democratic Alliance of Civil Opposition. Noriega simply ignored this result and tried to nullify the outcome. The United States interfered again, despite it being a violation of Article 5 of the 1977 treaty, and criticised Noriega. Noriega was clearly frustrated with the US criticism and refused to accept defeat, even going so far as to have one of his dignity battalions assault a protest led by Andara and his running mate, Guillermo Ford, leaving them both injured. Despite these events against Andara and Ford, it is important to note they never requested US intervention. Only the USA recognised Andara as the legitimate head of government. President Reagan had by now left office in January 1989, and his vice president, George H. Bush, took over as president in April 1989. He too deployed additional forces to Panama during Operation Nimrod Dancer. US forces deployed for Operation Nimrod Dancer included a brigade headquarters, a light infantry battalion from the 7th Infantry Division, a mechanised infantry battalion from the 5th Mechanised Infantry Division equipped with M113 armoured personnel carriers, a marine light armoured company 
equipped with LAV-25 light-armoured vehicles. Along with this troop deployment came Operation Blade Jewel, the evacuation of all unnecessary personnel, along with military families, to the United States, including those troops whose deployment was the longest. This actually reduced the potential security force in Panama, and was later identified as a critical mistake, which reduced the operational readiness of aviation resources. In August of 1989, the United States announced that it will not accept a candidate from Panama as administrator of the canal appointed by the Panamanian government. Noriega retaliated on the 1st of September, appointing a government of loyalists, and the US refused to recognize it. A second round of US troop withdrawals, known as Operation Blade Duel II, took place, and the CIA tried to interfere in internal Panamanian politics by organizing a Panamanian military coup in Costa Rica. About 200 junior officers led by Major Moises Giroldi skirmished around Panama City on the 3rd of October 1989, but they were quickly quashed by Battalion 2000. Having failed to get a candidate they liked elected fairly, and having twice failed to oust Noriega by means of a CIA-instigated coup, there was now little the United States could do, short of a full-scale invasion. Planning for invasion Contingency plans for the invasion were already underway, under the codename Blue Spoon, by General Maxwell Thurman. This involved helicopter assaults on various key local locations. On the 15th of November, a group of M551 Sheridans from the 3rd 73rd Armoured was deployed to Panama, arriving on the 16th at Howard Air Force Base and kept secret. The plan for their use was for the four tanks to work with a platoon of Marines, equipped with the LAV-25, to conduct reconnaissance operations. On top of those tanks in Panama, an armor-ready company size element was preparing at Fort Bragg to accompany and support the deployment of the 504th Parachute Infantry Regiment. As such, four of the M551 were fitted for low-velocity air delivery, whilst the other vehicles were prepared for a rollout from a landed aircraft. This would be the first time the M551 was ever dropped outside of a training environment. In late November, intelligence reports came in that Noriega and Colombian drug cartels were plotting car bomb attacks on US facilities. On the 30th of November, the United States upped the ante with the imposition of economic sanctions on Panamanian ships. Since Panama is used widely as a flag of convenience, 11,440 vessels transporting 65.6 .6 million gross tons of cargo couldn't land at a US port. It's war, sort of. On the 15th of December 1989, Noriega finally declared war in retaliation for the sanctions. The Panamanian Assembly, full of Noriega's loyalists, declared him to be maximum leader of the struggle for national liberation, which perhaps shows the motivation all along getting the US out of Panama. However, President Bush's White House spokesman, Marlon Fitzwater, declared this war was another hollow step in Noriega's attempt to force his rule on the Panamanian people. And no special precautions were put in place. Just a day after this declaration by the Panamanians, the situation changed dramatically. Four off-duty US officers drove past a Panamanian Defense Forces checkpoint and were fired upon. U.S. Marine Lieutenant Paz was killed, and another passenger was wounded. It was the killing of Lieutenant Paz which persuaded the U.S. it needed to intervene, and not the declaration of the day before. On the 16th of December 1989, the White House declared, Last Friday, Noriega declared a state of war with the United States. The next day, the PDF shot to death an unarmed American serviceman, wounded another, seized and beat another serviceman, and sexually threatened his wife. Under these circumstances, the president decided he must act to prevent further violence. The United States initiated its development phase of the invasion plan. For the M551 Sheridans, this entailed the fitting of 50 caliber heavy machine guns to the mounts on the turrets 
and the loading of Shillelagh missiles. It is noteworthy that the rules of engagement given to the crews of the M551s was that approval for firing the main gun had to be sought from and given by the task force commander, due to the high risk of hitting friendly troops or civilians, or of causing collateral damage. 20th December 1989. With the background of steadily escalating tensions between Panama and the United States, Bush's hawkishness and Noriega's naivety and overconfidence, the stage was set for the invasion. Officially named Operation Just Cause, as military planners felt it was more fitting than Operation Blue Spoon, it was put into action on the 20th of December 1989. That day, President Bush ordered 12,000 extra troops to Panama to supplement the 13,600 already there, with four publicly stated objectives. 1. Safeguard American lives. 2. Protect the democratic election process. 3. To arrest Noriega for drug trafficking and bring him to the United States for trials. 4. Protect the Panama Canal Treaty. The invasion began at 0100 hours on the 20th of December 1989, a time selected by General Steiner as being the most likely to achieve total surprise and also to ensure no commercial traffic at Torrijos Airport. Led by aircraft from Task Force Hawk, the 160th Special Operations Aviation Group, the 1st Battalion 128th Aviation Regiment and the 1st Battalion of the 82nd Airborne Division deployed across Panama, US troops deployed included Rangers, paratroopers, light infantry and Navy Marines and SEALs, totaling some 26,000 soldiers simultaneously attacking on 27 targets. Arranged against the US forces was the Panamanian Defense Force, with just two infantry battalions and ten independent infantry companies. In terms of armor, the Panamanians had 38 Cadillac gauge armored cars purchased from the United States. Modified with the addition of a 90mm Cockrell turret, Panama effectively had wheeled tanks, and if they could be deployed properly, they could constitute a genuine threat to US ground forces and their own armoured elements. Panama also had its own special forces units, including 11 Betalions de la Dignidad, or Dignity Battalions, paramilitary battalions, and some nondescript leftist units, with around 2,500 and 5,000 active members in total. The Panamanian police, known as the Fuerza de Policia, consisted of around 5,000 personnel with small arms. Although the police did contain two public order or civil disturbances units, known officially as the 1st and 2nd Compañías de Antimotines. There was also the less visible Departamento de Nacional de Investigaciones. This innocuous sounding organization was made up of around 1500 personnel and was little more than a barely disguised secret police force. Other smaller units available and armed within Panama included the Guardia Presidencial, Guardia Penitenciaria, Fuerza de Police Portuario, and the Guardia Forestal. The Panamanian Navy, or Fuerza de Marina Nacional, was headquartered at Fort Amador, with vessels berthed at Balboa and Colón. It was a small force of just 500 or so troops and operated eight landing craft and two logistic support ships made from converted landing craft, as well as a single troop transport. There was also a single naval infantry company, the first Compañía de Infantría de Marina, based at Coco Solo, and a small force of naval commandos, based out of Fort Amador. The Fuerza Aria Panamania was a tiny force of just 500 personnel. It operated 21 Bell UH-1 helicopters, this force amounted, across all aircraft including trainers, to just 38 fixed-wing aircraft on top of those helicopters. However, it also controlled a series of ZPU-4 anti-aircraft systems. The US, on the other hand, had a substantial military with an enormous budget and huge technical and vehicle resources at its disposal. American forces had a stock of the venerable M113 armoured personnel carrier, which had been in service since the 1960s. In addition to these, four US battalions were issued with LAVs, including one reserve battalion. 
These four were designated as LAV battalions until 1988. In 1988, the LAV designation for the battalion was changed to Light Armoured Infantry, or LAI, a term which stayed in use until they were rebranded once more in 1993 as Light Armoured Reconnaissance, or LAR. The first operational use of the LAV by US forces would be in the 1989 invasion of Panama. Thank you for joining us for our first video introducing the invasion of Panama. If you liked it, please leave a like and subscribe. You can find out more information relating to this invasion in the full article which is linked in the description. If you like what we are doing and want to let us continue working on these videos, please consider donating on Patreon or PayPal. All of the funds will be allocated to improving our articles and videos for you. Until next time, keep us in your sights.